All right, it's 8.01. Uh, welcome everybody. We are so glad that you're joining us tonight for our event uh, titled Connecting Just Mercy with Justice in New York City. My name is Charles. Uh, I also go by Cheech, as many of you know. I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Presbyterian Church downtown. Uh, a few months ago uh, with our church family, we had an evening very similar to this where we separately watched a movie, Just Mercy, and we came together to have a discussion around the themes of the film. If you don't know, the film is about the life of Brian Stevenson. He's a civil rights activist, lawyer, and his experiences of the criminal justice system, especially in regards to race. So although we had a wonderful night of discussion, we know that it's not enough to just simply watch a movie and talk about it. It's, we do that every night with our families. So we reached out to Hope for New York and partnered with them for our next step, which is tonight. We are connecting the movie and the themes of it to what's actually happening in our streets in New York City. So our hope for tonight is one or both of the following. Awareness and action. Awareness and action. We're going to be hearing from three organizations that work and minister in the area of criminal justice in various ways. So let me just give you the blueprint for tonight and give us a few housekeeping items. So our night's gonna be broken up into two halves. The first half will be a time of hearing from these three faith-based organizations, how they got involved, what their experience has been, and how their faith plays a role in the work that they do. And then the second half will be a time of Q&A. There's a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen where you can ask questions. You could also click the thumbs up and you can upvote these questions that you like and that you <laughs> hear answered. So um, please use that. Also, if you have a direct question for any of our panelists, our guests tonight, uh, please indicate that. Say their names or, or the organizations that they work for so that they can directly answer it. Without further ado, uh, let me welcome Tony Wong, who is both a, a member of Redeemer Downtown and staff at Hope for New York. And he's gonna share a little bit about the work that he does at Hope for New York and then introduce the affiliates. Tony. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Wong, and I am a staff member on the Hope for New York team. I'm also a member of Downtown Redeemer, so this evening is extra special for me. Hope for New York is a uh, mercy and justice ministry that was founded 25 years ago. Uh, at Hope for New York, we support we, the work of 60 affiliate organizations that serve New Yorkers, indeed, in all five boroughs. We support them through grants, capacity building programs, volunteer mobilization. We currently have 14 partner churches, including Redeemer Downtown, and we partner with churches to encourage Christians in getting proximate with our affiliates and the communities through volunteering, generosity, and learning opportunities like these. We are excited that you can join us tonight for an evening of conversation with our friends that have been serving our incarcerated or formerly incarcerated neighbors. Uh, before we start, some brief introductions on our three panelists. First off, we have Ruben Austria, who is the founding executive director of Community Connections for Youth. Reverend Austria is a respected advocate for juvenile justice reform and is recognized locally and nationally as an expert on community-based alternatives to incarceration. A recent affiliate since 2019, their mission is to empower grassroots faith and neighborhood organizations to develop effective community-driven alternatives to incarceration for youth. Next, we have Natika Washington, Vice President of Partner and Corporate Relations. Natika leads prison fellowships efforts to engage partners in identifying solutions to crime and incarceration. Uh, international development expert, she has worked to ensure equal access to human rights opportunities around the world, especially for women and girls. An affiliate since 2017, Prison Fellowship believes in a restorative approach that is grounded on the conviction that all people are created in God's image and that no life is beyond God's reach. Replacing the cycle of crime with the cycle of renewal, the desires to bring new hope and life purposes. And our third panelist, Dan Sanabria. There you go, Executive Director of Youth for Christ in New York City. Dan brings a wealth of leadership and experience from the youth ministry landscapes across New York City. In addition, in addition to leading youth ministry networks that impact hundreds of churches across our city, he's also the founder of a youth-led prayer initiative called God Belongs to My City. A recent uh, affiliate since 2019, their mission is to reach young people working together with the local church and other like-minded partners to raise up lifelong followers of Jesus who lead by their godliness and lifestyle, devotion to prayer, the word of God, and a passion for sharing the love of Christ. 
And finally, let me introduce our dear friend, Mary Beth, who will be facilitating tonight's conversation. Mary Beth is a committed Redeemer Delta member and hopefully New York volunteer leader. You might have seen her featured on the HFNY Instagram. She has been active in our Young Supporters Committee and is passionate about mercy and justice. Please, let's all welcome our facilitator and panelists for tonight. Mary Beth, passing this over to you. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in because I don't wanna waste any time. Um, I want you guys to talk for as long as possible. So um, first off, I'm gonna ask this question to all three of you. If you could just generally um, share about the work your organization does and what made you want to do that kind of work, how long have you been doing it, um, that kind of thing. So we'll start with Ruben and then Atika and then Dan. All right, thanks Mary Beth and uh, thanks to Hope for New York and for uh, Cheech and everybody watching. Uh, so the organization um, that I started about 10 years ago, Community Connections for Youth, um, our vision is a world with no kids in cages. Um, we don't believe it's natural to put young people behind bars. Um, and we also believe that the, the way that that happens is by restoring community, uh, to do what community has always been meant to do, to, uh, to support, to hold accountable, to nurture, to serve young people who are getting in trouble with the law. Uh, we do it in two major ways. One is that we just serve our own immediate neighborhood in the South Bronx. Um, by mobilizing different groups, um, you know, in, in addition to our organization, a number of different faith and neighborhood based organizations uh, to divert young people from justice system involvement after they get arrested and then to keep working with them, um, you know, until they make it to a successful adulthood, hopefully. Um, but on a broader scale, uh, work to train and to equip and to advocate uh, for communities all over the country. Um, to develop similar types of initiatives uh, of just standing in the gap for young people and providing that type of support um, to keep young people from uh, going into the system and, and from becoming repeat customers. Great, I think I'm next. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm happy to be here um, to share the work of uh, Prison Fellowship. Um, and it's specifically just um, how God has called me uh, to be a part of this prison ministry. I've been with Prison Fellowship now for uh, three years. Um, and so we are um, the nation's largest Christian nonprofit serving um, former prisoners, uh, prisoners and their families and the leading um, advocate for criminal justice reform. And um, as a Christian organization, we are you know, called by Jesus to remember those in prison and so during his time in federal prison in 1974, founder uh, Chuck Colson witnessed the absence of hope um, that overwhelmed so many men um, with whom he served time and promised to never forget that. And so in 1976, that's when Prison Fellowship was founded. And so for over four decades, our organization has been serving um, and impacting lives of um, individuals affected by crime and incarceration uh, to the tune of 550,000 a year um, ex and explicitly in partnership with Hope for New York in um, New York City. Um, and we do that in um, through a multi-pronged uh, approach. We attack it by trying to address or implement solutions that will come at the issue of reform at every stage to achieve a more successful uh, justice reform outcome. And so we do that by continuing to advance restorative justice policies, um, which um, we believe that alternatives to incarceration um, are, um, are um, necessary and that we um, have issues in our criminal justice system that are affecting um, individuals across the nation, especially uh, people of color um, that are disproportionately affected um, by the current criminal justice system. And so um, our expansion of our in-prison programming and how we work with men and women who are incarcerated um, through our uh, transformational leadership program um, and partnership 
partnership with wardens in our um, in-prison program um, known as the Academy. Um, we, we do that in an effort to try to restore the communities within um, prison settings in an effort to restore the individuals and to uh, restore them back um, in hopefully a life with, um, with, uh, with God. Um, the other way that we do that is through our annual Second Chance Month public awareness campaign. Um, a various different uh, state level public policy reforms have, have happened where we were able to reduce um, collateral consequences of criminal convictions um, and to help uh, formerly incarcer incarcerated um, individuals overcome the obstacles that they face with integrating back into community. And so um, the impact of uh, prison fellowship solutions span beyond the boundaries of, you know, we feel, sorry about that. Oh. Oh, sorry about that. Um, we feel uh, beyond the boundaries of, you know, just uh, the prison cell. Um, and so we see, you know, the work that we do with working to successfully uh, reform criminal justice as a core comp a component of the work that we do um, here at Prison Fellowship. So we're happy to be here today and to have a conversation with everyone and talk about um, this issue. I'm happy to be here. Hey guys, it's Dan Sanabria from Youth for Christ. I am excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of that. I feel like the, I'm the young guy here um, when it comes to this type of ministry. But I've been a youth pastor for about 15 years, uh, and I started working with Youth for Christ for about four years now. And when they told me to work with young people and get paid, I said, let's do it. I'm ready to go. Been volunteering for a long time. I'm ready to get paid. And so uh, I joined the group, but they told me, hey, Danny, you got to reach young people incarcerated. This is a ministry we've been doing for 60 years across the country, reaching young people that are incarcerated. And I think the city needs, um, you know, this also. Um, and I just said, I don't, I, don't, I don't know this. This is not my lane. I'm, I'm, I'm about young people in the community. And uh, I knew somebody, and I called Ruben, called a bunch of other people. And I said, hey, guys, teach me your ways. And, and, and Ruben, I would just, I, Ruben's the godfather, I call him. He's the godfather in incarceration when it comes to young people. And I called him up and he, he just told me to come to one of the uh, facilities in the Bronx. And he said, just, just hang out with my team. I sat there I, I, and I met a young girl that was 14 years old, got incarcerated. And she told me her story and her story broke, broke my heart. And the Lord said, this is where I want you to be. I want you to reach the kids in the darkest areas of their lives. And um, four and a half years later, we're in the facilities doing mentoring programs, uh, Bible studies, and we want to do more. And I'm a big advocate of working with young people one-on-one. -on -one. I believe in order for us to change the system, I really believe in mentoring. I really believe in going in there and, and fighting the fight for these young people. You know, I've, I've going to their court dates and being the church to the young people. You see, when a kid comes back home, they only know their neighborhood. But I believe every Christian, every neighborhood has a Christian. And so mobilizing mentors in every single neighborhood, mobilizing churches in every single neighborhood, and showing them the issues of the system, showing them that there are young people that need the church and that need the believers to mentor them and walk with them. So going in there and mentoring them one-on-one -on -one and see God do an amazing stuff is what we do. Youth for Christ is what it's all about. And so I'm happy to be a part of this amazing um, panelist to talk about how can the church make a difference. So Hopefully, New York, thank you for putting this together, and uh, Redeemer, I appreciate it. Thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, the next question I'm going to direct to Ruben, but, but Natika and Dan, you can feel free to add on. Um, Ruben, how does your faith impact your work? Hmm. Um, you know, beyond impacting, I mean, the, my faith is the reason I do the work. Uh, to begin with, um, I, I still find it one of God's kind of comedies that this is the type of work that I'm doing. Because as a young man growing up in New York City in the 80s, um, I, you know, I, I just, I, coming of age uh, during the height of the crack epidemic, the number one thing that I wanted for my life was just uh, to get out of New York. Um, and, and I wanted to get out and never look back. Um, and uh, when I went upstate, and I went upstate, uh, you know, to college, um, and that was when I first started to, to realize just the, the disparities in our society and that most young men from communities like mine in New York City who were going upstate were not going upstate uh, to college, but were actually going to 
populate the uh, the prison towns of upstate New York, um, and 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 God called me uh, to work with young people, um, and I, I came back and started working with young people in the Bronx in 1998. Um, but I would say that that it was getting involved uh, with young people um, and just seeing the, uh, the kind of the devastation that was going on. And, and at the time, honestly, um, a, a lot of what I was seeing was stuff that was happening on the streets. Uh, you know, it was young people getting killed. It was uh, so much gang violence and, uh, you know, kind of like a good evangelical, a good Pentecostal. I, you know, I, I just said, well, you know, God, why is all this happening? And really believing that, you know, the answer is in the scriptures and searching the scriptures and just saying, you know, what, what, what is destroying our young people and, and, and uh, especially our young men. And the interesting thing is that as I started to search the scriptures for this, uh, what I saw in the scriptures was that there's two times in the scriptures where uh, you, you kind of see uh, the, the loss of a generation of boys. Um, and, and that's uh, when the uh, the Pharaoh is is trying to wipe out the um, the Hebrew children, and then the next time when Herod is trying to wipe out again all the Hebrew children, um, you know, because he hears Jesus being born. But something hit me at that time where I said, "Man, you know, we spend all of our time uh, thinking about individual young people. Why are they doing this? Why are they behaving like this?" And yet in Scripture, the two times that you see the loss of a generation is actually at the hands of the state. Um, and so, as, as Daniel mentioned, as I started going to court with young people and started to see what was happening, um, you know, it was as if God gave me a, a, an understanding of what was happening, um, similar to, to when the baby boys were being tossed into the Nile, um, that a lot of our young people in New York City were literally going up the river, uh, you know, to, to populate these prison towns of upstate New York, um, but that we were uh, able, uh, like Daniel said, to go to court with young people, to ask them to be um, brought back and cared for by their own community instead of uh, going upstream. Um, and, and then I also, uh, you know, grew to believe that just the way that um, uh, Moses was pulled out of the water, um, that, that years later when he became an adult, he and his sister would go uh, before Pharaoh and, and, and say, let my people go. Um, and that God wanted uh, not only the, um, the salvation and the, the deliverance of, of individuals, um, but also had a plan to bring a people um, out of a situation of captivity and oppression and destruction. And so um, it's been my faith that sustained me doing this for 20 years. Um, and I would just say that, that like Daniel said, the, the, the darkness of what's happening in this system of incarceration. Um, and, and for me to see it, uh, you know, going into it as a 24 year old and see what was happening, um, really, you know, really almost crushed my spirit, you know, brought me to the place of losing hope. Um, but in, in such a situation of extreme darkness, um, you know, man, that's, that's, that's when it's like, you know, e either God is going to show up and, and give you the, the strength and the hope uh, to believe in his hand to move through it, you know, or, or you give up. And, um, you know, I was close to giving up, but, but God showed up in many ways uh, to convince me that this is not just uh, the plans of man. Um, you know, it, it is his passion. It is his purpose. Um, and he will give strength to those who are fighting this fight. Thanks, Ruben. Um, is breaking up really bad. Can you hear me better now? Okay, <laughs> hopefully, it, hopefully it keeps going. Um, Natika, the next question is for you. Um, you sort of mentioned at the, be at the beginning when you said um, people of color were disproportionately affected by the system. Um, so going off of that, I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about kind of the current moment about um, the recent racial injustice and how do you see that in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's a question that uh, a lot of people are, uh, have been uh, answering. Uh, I will say this, um, in this moment in time and me personally, what I've been experiencing and what I've heard and the things that I've, um, been in conversations with people in our country who are hurt, you know, many of, the, of those people are 
you know, people in my own community. Um, so I would say, you know, for Black people in America, this is not new for us. Uh, racial injustice um, has been happening in our community for centuries um, in this country. And so for us, um, we aren't, we, this, is, this is not a new um, moment. I think that where we are right now in this moment is that we're tired that we continue to have these moments. We're tired that we have to continue to, you know, convene and have these conversations about a harmful sin in our country. When you think about racism and um, how it has affected a people, a culture of people in this country. And so I think that, you know, for me personally, and I can't speak for every black person, but me personally, I'm just tired. Um, and I hope that we get to a point, especially as Christians, um, in this country where we can come together and actually uh, figure out a true path to true reconciliation on a systemic issue in this country, which I consider systemic sin, you know, in this country, um, that we as Christians come together across all faiths and, and um, races and put together a plan that's actually a true process to reconciliation. Um, you know, you mentioned that the um, uh, Downtown Redeemer is going through Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, amazing book, amazing movie, amazing uh, uh, leader um, in, in what he, he's done. But I, I, you know, that movie just shows the tireless work of so many African American and just leaders in this country fighting on um, for an issue that we've been fighting for for years, but it also paints a picture of a very fractured criminal justice system that disproportionately affects people of color in this country. And so, you know, a lot of the conversations that I've been having over the the last couple of weeks is you know, what is systemic racism? You know, like, how is that affecting, you know, so many uh, people in this country and people of color? And I have to explain it. And I feel like Just Mercy is the perfect example and paints a picture of what systemic racism looks like in a criminal justice system. Um, and that's why what we do at Prison Fellowship is, is to fight to break down those systematic barriers that continue to hold um, people of color in this country that are incarcerated, you know, by, you know, uh, the, the millions um, to break that cycle in the, in the country. So um, I'm optimistic, however, um, that the current moment is a moment in time that will bring forth change and i'll tell you why because i think god is in the moment i think god is in this moment because you see so many of our brothers and sisters across all faiths religions around the world standing up right now and saying no we are this is not who we are we don't agree with this and racism is there's no place in our world for this so I think that we have a lot of work to do, but I think that the church plays a crucial part in being the solution to a very horrible and disgusting problem that we have in this country. Thanks, Natika. I'm seeing some amens in the chat, so people are hearing you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Yeah. Yes. We're just okay. up a little bit. Um, can you? Okay. So my question is to Dan. I'm sorry, guys. Um, what what does it take? I think the question was to Dan. Um, what does it take to do this kind of work? What does it take to do this kind of work? I mean, I mean, listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to God. I mean, God is calling you to make a difference no matter what you do, right? You know, I, I feel like, you know, 
we, we as church members, as people, we just want to do the thing and focus on ministry or what we want to do. I think we put ministry in boxes. And I think this is a, this is not a, a box thing. This is a, a missional thing. This is a mission thing for the gospel. It's clean. It's simple. It's in the Bible. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, name and follow us on the Holy Spirit, right? And, and, and merge yourself with the gospel. And I think if the gospel is true to you and it's true to your heart and it's changed your life, this, you, I always tell my young people, when you accept Christ for Savior, you cannot stop talking about Jesus. It's just, it's in us. You just cannot do it. I, I cannot stop it. If I, if I just go to church on Sunday and just do my thing and come home, that's not, that's not the point. I mean, we have an opportunity every day to make a difference in someone's life. If it's a neighbor, you know, for, for example, I, I have an opportunity right now. I've been living in my neighborhood for 15 years. And I didn't know anyone in my neighborhood because I was so busy going in and out. This quarantine has put me to a place. Now I'm, I met like all of my neighbors and I'm like, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to share my faith to them, to share opportunities for these people. So to do this type of ministry, it's, it's not that you need, you know, a master's degree. It's not that you need a degree to do these things. This is not, it's about caring and loving people caring and loving people. And, and for me, it's, are you willing to take discipleship to the next level? Are you willing to do the work and, and, get, and, and get dirty? I, I believe that we all, I mean, I, if you don't smell like sheep, you're not discipling. You got to smell like sheep when you're doing these things. And so for me, when I work with these young people, I work with these young people, not because it's my job, it's because it's my calling. Not because, I, you know, I get paid for now. Thank God, I, I thank God for that. But not that, you know, not because, you know, my boss told me to do this. It's because there's an, there's an issue here. And as a Christian, we got to go in the darkness. We got to go in the darkness. And I applaud like Ruben and I applaud a prison fellowship. I applaud all these people that's been before me breaking down these walls. And then I'm realizing 10 years later in ministry, 15 years later in ministry with young people, like, man, this is a problem. This is a problem that we have to run to and not wait until it comes to us. I'm not, I'm not waiting until I, the crime is going to come to my neighborhood to say something. I want to, I want to go to them and help them serve them in, in, in a mighty way. My older brother is a police officer. He's an NYPD captain. And I went to visit him one day and he's, he gave me this gigantic book of all the criminals in the neighborhood. And I, I looked at this book and I said, can I see what's in there? And he's like, yeah, I, the purpose is I want you to see, you know, who are you arrested? And I opened this book and, and I off the bat, all men, 99% all men, African American brothers, black brothers, Latino brothers, sisters, brothers. And, and he goes, look at their crimes. I look at their crimes. He goes, I want you to look at when they started. And I looked at when they started. He goes, this is the issue, Danny. It's when they started. It's not what they're doing. It's when they started. And I look at him, he was 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And I, I look at their rap sheet. He goes, he goes, do me a favor. He looked at me and said, he goes, do me a favor. Do your job reaching these people. Because I have to do my job. And he goes, we have to stop, stop now, go there now. And so my job right now as an executive director is to knock on churches, knock on the big buildings that have gates in them that's 24-7, you know, locked. You can't even go there until Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Knock on those churches and say, hey, there's an issue here. Would you help me reach these people? Would you help me? Because you have an army of people. You have an army of loving that lo people that love Jesus. Can't, this is the issue. This is the issue. Can you join me? And can I join you? And so it takes just the call of God upon your life as you're following Christ. It's not easy. Let me tell you something. As a mentor, as a worker for working with kids that are formerly incarcerated and incarcerated, man, I've, I've lost time. I've lost money. I've lost, I've lost a lot, but guess what? At the end of the day, it is so worth it. It's so worth it to get that phone call. When you're working with a kid two years later, calling you up and say, I got a job. I work FedEx now. And they're telling you, thank you for not giving up on me. Cause that kid, I want to give up on him every Monday morning. Cause he's just on, you know, but, but it's worth it. And it's, and are you willing to do the hard work? And, it, and it, guess what? And, that's, and this is the thing. It's not just for juvenile justice ministry. It's for every type of ministry. 
working with homeless, working with families, mothers, and working with anybody. It is a lot of work. Are you willing to be a true disciple, disciple maker? Thanks. I'll ask one more question and then we'll pass it over to Cheech, who's been monitoring that. Um, It's all good. That's um, Wi-Fi is going in and out. So you know what? I'm just going to take over. It's time for Q&A, baby. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure um, the question that she's going to ask is probably going to be answered within the Q&A as well. So you know what? We'll transition into that. For those of you that um, you probably can see the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. I see a few questions have come in already. But please, if you have a question, um, ask it and we will hopefully get to it um, in this time. So we're just gonna go in. Uh, Erica Smith asks uh, specifics, what should we do as a church? And I think this, this was um, in particular to when Natika was sharing about um, the call to the church, that the church needs to step up and that this is a, a systemic sin. That's what you said. So um, maybe, is there one specific that you oh, want? I have so many ideas, so many ways that you can get involved. <laughs> So, so, so one, one way is obviously educating yourself. I love that downtown Redeemer, um, you know, chose to uh, read and, and watch the Brian Stevens and Just Mercy um, uh, movie. It's, it's phenomenal. Caring about the issue and wanting to actually do something is the first step. Other ways that you can actively get engaged, get engaged with local organizations that are doing this work in your community organizations like the ones that you see on this screen, you can directly get involved if you don't feel comfortable or don't know much about criminal justice um, reform and how to engage from a Christian perspective. Prison Fellowship has a small group um, curriculum called Outrageous Justice that we issue for free of charge to all uh, uh, Christians, uh, churches across the country. If you're interested in understanding what the response should be from a Christian perspective and how you can particularly get involved as an individual, you can go to our website and uh, request to um, participate in the Outrageous Justice Study Group uh, sessions. They are meant to be small groups, but they can be long-term. You can support the children of incarcerated men and women. Uh, we have so many, so many of, our, of, of my uh, colleagues on the panel are already supporting youth. There is a need for us to continue to do that. Um, and then you can get involved by using your voice. How many of you are in positions where you actually can articulate to people who are in, ha, in positions of power to change something? So use your voice, become an advocate. We have ways that you can, we can train you how to advocate for legislative reforms. So Cheech, I can go on and on, so I'll shut up and I'll let the other panelists come in um, and, and say something. <laughs> Thanks, Tatika. Somebody said, T tell me them all. So, you know. I will happily send a list of all. And of course, I will be connected to you guys, you know, forever. So you can always connect with me as well. Yes, thank you, thank you. Dan or Ruben, maybe one of you want to jump in and add to that, if you have anything. Yeah, um, I just want to echo what um, Natika said that uh, from a, uh, a policy and a systemic level, um, you know, what I've witnessed um, over the last couple decades is a couple times when the church got involved, um, even in just some small ways, but I'm, I'm thinking back, right, to uh, probably back to maybe around 2002, 2003, um, when we learned about New York City's plan to just expand the juvenile detention centers. Um, and, and they were going to spend about $70 million to add more beds. Um, and I just want to share this stat with you real quick, because this, this should be staggering. I, I just got this today. It was like the up, 
update on how much we spend uh, per youth that we're incarcerating. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it even blew me away, even though I've been, uh, you know, doing this for many years. But in New York, um, we spend uh, $2,444 per day uh, to incarcerate just one young person. Um, and so I'm sure there's some people who are good at math, but if you're like me and you're not, and you need the uh, shortcut, um, that annualizes to $892,206 per year. Um, and so there, uh, there is a ton of money uh, going into this stuff. And you probably heard uh, people say um, budgets are moral documents. Um, and, and so over and over again, I think what this present moment is showing us, um, the, the, the George Floyd protests, is that um, it, it, it's, while it is about police brutality, it's also about uh, the choices that our society makes of choosing to invest in criminal justice solutions, uh, choosing to invest in kind of the most uh, harmful and oppressive types of responses uh, to distressed communities. Um, and what communities are really saying is that, you know, again, this 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 incredible amount of money that you are are using to confine people, to hold people down, uh, to uh, just to, to suppress, um, you know, could those investments not be made on better things, right? On, on things that would uplift communities, on things, on better housing, on mentoring, on on job support, on recreation, so many things. Um, and so to come back to the story I was talking about, we had one night, it was probably like 2004, and it was a national day of prayer and, um, and you know, conservative type group type thing, right, where, you know, it's not supposed to be, uh, you know, really so much about social action, but, you know, you're praying for the country. And, and I got permission just to distribute these postcards asking people to, um, well, one, to pray the, against that plan to, to build to expand the juvenile jails, but also just to send a postcard, you know, to the mayor's office. And, um, and you know, we've been fighting this campaign for a while, but it was like a couple weeks after that night um, that the city canceled the plan uh, to expand those juvenile detention centers. And 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 I do agree um, with Natika that when the when people of faith speak up and they speak out in mass, it's 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 definitely a sign to the powers that be that okay, this is not just you know. Uh, some crazy activists like me or, you know, these kind of folks who are out there, but, you know, people believe in this. Um, we did that again in 2012 to get the spot for juvenile detention center shut down. Um, and even uh, today, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, uh, but New York City sort of did a bait and switch with a plan to close Rikers. Um, deciding that uh, you know they would they would commit to closing Rikers, but now planning to spend eleven billion dollars to build four new jails. Um, and so when we think about these numbers, right, and you think about eleven billion, and you think about what uh, you know Danny is saying about the types of interventions that could be done early on uh, to not let people go down that route, um, it, it really is uh, like Natika said, it's a it's it's a moral sin, it's a structural sin to make choices to invest so many of our resources in incarceration. Um, and so we always encourage, you know, people of faith to stand up and to do it as churches. Um, because uh, again, um, I've seen so many times where the, the powers that be, um, when they see pastors sign on, when they see churches sign on, right? If it's an individual signing on, that's one individual, that's one voter. If it's a church, it's like, oh shoot, you know, that's a hundred, that's 200 voters. Um, and then there's some amazing other ways that you can just get involved individually with young people. Um, but I'll let uh, Dan talk about that since that's his passion driving right now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's important for the church to be very open to the community. Um, literally get to know your business owners, get to know your precincts, get to know the people. I think every leader needs to know that. I think for me, when I went to a precinct and I said to a priest, hey, where are the bad kids at? Where are the tough kids at? Where are the ones that, that need a love, that need love and need mentor? They're like, are you serious? Are you really asking that question? I'm like, yeah, where they're at. Let's go visit them. Let's go figure this out. And I got called again by the cops and the cops came in and the, pre, uh, the captain brought us in and says, uh, I need you guys. I need your help, you know, and we have these couple, you have nine kids that are messing up our whole neighborhood, nine kids. And I'm like, oh, nine kids, that's it. And, and they probably know a lot more. Uh, but I was like, if we can just mobilize churches in the neighborhood to, to work with the kids, 
you know, to open their doors for after school program, open their doors to, to, to mentoring, uh, mentoring these kids. It's, it, again, we just got to get out of our doors. And so one of my, my brother told me, hey, Danny, every time, and this was part of last year, he said, every time I arrest a kid, I'm going to call you. Every time I, my police arrest a kid, I'm going to call you to come in and meet with the kid and just talk to them about life. And I was like, I'm down with that. And I actually went to go to every time he called me, it was at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. This is the question. Are you willing to do things like that? To really take like wake up in the morning, someone calling you and say, hey, can you come to this crime scene? Or can you come to see a kid that just got arrested at any moment, any time? And so I did that. And we did that for a bunch of times. It was late. We drove there. We got there, met some kids. Long story short, I went to do a Bible, Bible public, public reading of the scripture by grace and mercy we did in the prison um, for nine months. And one of the kids was there. He looked at me, he goes, I know you. And I was like, oh no, oh God, he's gonna get me. And he goes, I know you from somewhere. And I was like, I looked at him close and said, yeah, you, you, I recognize you. He goes, you're the one that visited me when I, got, when I got arrested in the precinct. You're the one that visited me. And he gives me the biggest hug. He gave me the biggest hug, and I said, man, I can't wait when we come out. We can do more life together. It's just, are we willing to, are you willing to get a phone call from, from me to, in your neighborhood and say, hey, there's a kid that's came out of prison. Uh, we've been working with him for a couple of months or a year, uh, can, and he lives four blocks away from you. Are you willing to work with him to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, or can you hang out with him? If I call you, would you do that? That's the stuff the church used to do. Um, and I know we're busy. I know, I know this, I was born and raised in the city, I'm a Brooklyn boy. I understand completely. I know we got to hustle doing our stuff, but I'm telling you what, this is the kingdom stuff that we got to do. I wanted to do that and, and to take the next step of, um, reaching out to the young people. And I think we have to, I, listen, I, I want, I'm going to be the advocate to shut down jails. I'm going to be the advocate to do all that. I'm a hundred percent, but, but let me tell you something right now. If we reach the kid, young people now and do all of what we can do now, they don't have to go there. They don't have to go there. We could stop them now. We could do that. So you want to get involved? Guess what? Maybe not get involved in Youth for Christ. Get involved in your local youth ministry. Get involved right there. I have so many kids I've worked with for so, for so many years. I, I promise you, so many of them should have went to jail. They should have, they, they, they could have gone that route. But they rather be with their mentees in the local church. They'd rather be, if I gave a key to my youth, to all my young people, they would be in the church today, hanging out, because they know what family, family feels like, and that's the local church. So let's turn our city upside down. Thanks, man. You know, I, I love what all three of you shared because one of the questions that has been upvoted says, for so long, many churches have appeared to live outside of its local community and its challenges. How are the church leaders and ministries being trained to use this time to make a difference? And Dan, you're talking about individual level, one-on-one. -on -one. Get, get, you said, smell like sheep. You gotta smell like sheep. You gotta be there in front of them, face-to-face, -face, um, life on life. And Ruben, you're talking about legal. You're talking about um, budgets. And that's, you know, that's very important too. And then Natika, you're talking about systemic change and especially what churches can be doing as an organization and on a spiritual level being trained and having these curriculum so i think you guys kind of gave a huge spectrum that we can get involved in some people are being called and inspired right now to look up you know some of the budgets others are, are looking at the curriculum um, and for their churches others are thinking about dan and youth for christ and how can they get involved there so i appreciate all the answers actually um, this is a question that, that is here, where is it up? Uh, pragmatically, how can we support, given we are in the middle of a pandemic? And I'm sure all of you, just like all the churches, have had to think about this. So maybe, maybe uh, Natika, um, if you could answer that. Sure. Um, during COVID-19, one of the things that we have seen uh, as a need in prison, while everyone is locked out, um, there's still a need for hope. And so we have had a booming request for Bibles across the country. 
So you can absolutely support Prison Fellowship's Bible campaign. We've already sent thousands of Bibles to prisons, thousands of prisons across the country, and we can't keep up with the amount of requests that are coming in. Um, so that's uh, definitely one way um, that people can get involved right now um, in this time. Um, for individuals that may um, have um, great content or stories or be involved with uh, uh, multimedia production um, stories that would be uh, a great uh, use for individuals that are in prison and needing some inspirational information um, and uh, just messaging about God. We have a platform that we set up specifically during uh, um, COVID called Floodlight where we're providing inspirational content behind bars during a time of, of, of lockout. Um, and then our, um, our uh, way that we're serving families is through um, providing food by partnerships with uh, grocery stores across the, the country. And so we're serving families in New York um, by providing um, grocery cards um, to families who aren't working and need to feed their, their families, um, their children. I mean, things like that. So those are some tangible ways right now that individuals or um, the church can get involved. Thanks, Natika. Um, I like this question as well. I'm, I'm assuming it's for Ruben, but others can answer as well. Any specific legislative reforms that we should be supporting or maybe even thinking about? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, I would say, you know, right now, I mean, New York City has, and New York State have actually done a lot uh, on the legislative front. Um, you know, and there's been some pretty big uh, legislative decisions passed, um, uh, things around like uh, the, the discovery laws that now prosecutors can't hold that, um, you know, indefinitely while uh, people are waiting for bail. Um, what, what I would say, though, is that, you know, again, the, in, in, in the case of New York, uh, that, so there's a couple things right now, right? And, and, and one is that there's this whole uh, debate going on over the bail reform. Um, and uh, New York passed some really sweeping bail reform that went into effect on January 1st. Um, and some of it has already been rolled back and is being rolled back as uh, people are um, you know, mostly the police and, and prosecutors are saying it's gone too far and, and are, are linking um, some of the increased uh, shootings and murders to that bail reform. When you really get into the numbers, uh, it's not connected to the bail reform, right? And they've even done some really deep analysis about uh, the people who've been released on bail are only connected or involved in like 1% of the shootings, right? Um, so it's um you know i would say one thing is is not to fall prey to the uh the, the efforts to to push back the bail reform uh, because that is something that keeps so many low-income new yorkers um especially black and brown new yorkers um detained unnecessarily um but i would say beyond that again i'm, I'm just gonna come back uh to the uh, the budgets, right? And and what one of the things that happens every year in New York State, and, and we were able to largely defeat it with the juvenile justice system, um, but every year, as even the numbers of New Yorkers uh, incarcerated has been going down, um, there will often be a move sometimes by different state agencies to say, let's, uh, let's close down some facilities that we don't need anymore, right? Let's close down this prison uh, that costs us $10 million a year to operate and it's only a quarter full, right? And every single year what happens is that the legislators uh, and the unions in the counties where these prisons are, um, they, I mean, they really go to bat for, for what for them are those jobs, right? And, and kind of say, you know, save our facilities. Um, and a lot of times in the legislature, they just kind of give in to that and say, okay, that's kind of the political horse trading, right? You get to keep your prison. Um, but we're actually at a place in New York, the, the, the numbers that I share with you of why it's so expensive to lock up a young person in New York, um, part of that is a false cost because it's that we've been reducing the number of young people going into facilities. Um, but until you, sh until you close down these prisons, right, you still got to pay for the, the whole cost, right? It's like, 
It's like if 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 you and your friends order a pizza, um, you know, and you say we're all going to chip in, right? And everybody's going to pay like you know the, the we're going to chip in for a slice. You got eight people, and the pizza costs eight bucks, and you each pay a dollar. But let's say six of your friends just decide not to go in on it, you know, then then you're each paying four dollars, right, to for the cost of that pizza. You don't get a discount because your friends uh, didn't eat the pizza. If you're following me. Um, but again, part of that 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 legislative work would be that budget justice um, to really examine right how much money is going in a, a big thing. And again, it's it's um, a lot of a lot of the stuff in New York legislatively. It doesn't almost everything in New York happens through the budget, right? That's the best way. The state when the state budget gets passed, that's where they stick everything in. And so it's to really look at those budgets and to ask the question, what are these budgets doing for poor people? What are they doing for communities of color? Um, I, I'll give you a big uh, example right now, right? Part of why people are so upset, um, the NYPD is a $6 billion budget, right? But under COVID-19, one of the things that New York City chose to cut, right, with the, 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 the falling revenues um, was a $75 million program to provide summer jobs for young people, right? And, and that was devastating. Right. And you think about like young people who are already uh, a little bit desperate, already may have too much time on their hands and to take away a source of employment. Um, and so, again, thank God uh, for groups like Hope for New York, uh, groups like the New York Community Trust. We were able to get emergency grant funding to give 24 of our young people summer jobs um, to replace what the city had cut out of the budget. Um, and so I'm, I'm jumping to other things now. Right. But I would say, again, really in New York in particular, the budget is where legislation often gets passed. Um, and we often don't realize that in New York because we're, we're thinking there's gonna be some special introduction. It's almost always in the budget. And so it's to pay attention to those annual budgets and see where the money is going. Thanks, Ruben. Um, I think our time is up for Q&A, but uh, I'm gonna bring Tony back. And I think he's gonna be uh, asking all of the affiliates, all you guests, um, to kind of share about how we could get involved. How can we support? Um, what can we do? So, Tony. Yeah, um, just uh, one question for each person uh, around the panel. Just uh, one specific thing that you want to just shout out now, ways that they can be involved uh, from the downtown church side or from just churches that are, are part of uh, this uh, panel conversation. Uh, what is that one thing? I'll go. If you haven't signed uh, the Justice Declaration as a church, sign the Justice Declaration. And if you are an individual um, within uh, Downtown Redeemer that wants to advocate for restorative justice, go to our website and become a Justice Ambassador to learn how to get involved specifically in the state of New York. How about Ruben or Dan? Yeah, Dan. Ruben, you want me to go? Because I, I could take a long time for this one, bro. <laughs> no, listen, um, how can you get involved? Man, um, this is my vision. A thousand mentors in New York City. Okay, that's my vision. 200 per borough. Uh, my vision is that there are mentors ready when kids come out of jail, that they're there in their community. So go to YFC, nyc.net. Uh, join our, join our uh, see the stories, our vision casting nights on Zoom. Um, apply, put your application in and get ready to mentor kids and mentor young people. So, man, there's so much more I could say, but I, this is what I need. I, need, I We just need mentor. I, and Ruben needs mentors. Like, we all need mentors too. We need people that are willing to, to not look at this as a checklist. Let's just, I, I have to say it. Do not look at this. This a great panel. Redeemer, thank you for having Like, I did juvenile justice, amen, let's go. No, no, I, this is kingdom stuff. This is long-term. This is consistency. This is all that good stuff. Um, this is smelling like sheep. So, Ruben, go ahead, brother. Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, right now it's, it's challenging uh, under COVID-19. Um, a lot of our work with young people and families is it's probably 75% virtual just like this, right? And we're not getting together the way that we normally do. Um, if we were meeting in person, we would say, you know, we just love you to come and just, you know, join some of our groups, sit in circle with our families, get to know people and let stuff grow organically out of that. Um, but I will say, and I know I owe Tony updated volunteer opportunities, but 
uh, one of the things that we really believe, um, right, that, that our work is hyper-local in the South Bronx. And so when we're engaging uh, faith communities, it's, it's often the ones that are right there in the neighborhood because we want that proximity to our young people. Um, but we also believe in expanding networks of social capital. And we know that, uh, right, the Redeemer Network, there's, there's tons of social capital, right? There are people who are connected um, to multiple kinds of potential career opportunities, right? Or just different, um, you know, just the types of stuff that, like Dan said, some young people who are just not even, their world is the neighborhood, right? Their world is a few blocks. Um, and, and we know that, that kind of being in the streets of the South Bronx, chasing young people down isn't for everybody. Um, but we believe that when we connect the body, right, and, and we have those, those local mentors who are formerly incarcerated, who are credible messengers working with young people, but then as young people start to say, you know, hey, you know I'm, I'm, I'm interested in architecture, right, or I'm interested in engineering, or I'm interested in computer science, and just start to say, hey, you know, we, we could connect you with somebody who's in that field, and they could just tell you a little bit about what it takes to get there, and we start to build those networks so that then, uh, you know, the, the, the people who they're connected to, right, they, they got the people in the neighborhood and those are the groups that we're working with most closely. But they also got tons of people outside the neighborhood who can say, hey, maybe I can make a phone call for you. Maybe I can offer an internship. Maybe I could open a door. Um, and we'd love to partner in some of those ways. Great. Thank you, guys. And we will be following up this event with some communications on how you can uh, actively be involved, uh, engage with our affiliates. And if you opted into our emails during registration, you'll receive updates from us. If you didn't opt in, email info at hfny.org, info at hfny.org to ask for updates. Uh, as you have heard from them tonight, our team at Hope New York will be sharing ways that we, you can support the work that's happening on the ground. Thank you again, uh, Ruben, Natika, uh, Dan. Um, and we're gonna just uh, uh, go back to, to Charles, who's gonna close us in, in prayer. Yeah, again, just thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for um, our guest tonight. Uh, thank you for taking the time out and, and educating us, really, and inspiring us. You guys are the ones that have been doing this hard work for years and years. And um, I, I believe that uh, tonight, God is on the move, and his spirit is here amongst us. And so hopefully, um, out of the 102 people that are still here, um, there will be some action we're going to move on that because of the Holy Spirit and he's with us. So uh, let's pray um, and we'll end our night. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you because you are the one that is the God of justice, the one who uh, is of true justice. And so we ask, Lord, for this night to bear fruit. Lord, that as we sign off, that these things and the words that were shared, uh, what we heard tonight would would linger on, that it would marinate within us, and we would have discussions about it with our family members and our friends and in our community groups and within our churches. By your spirit, would you stir up our souls so that we may join in what's going on and has been going on through your people. Lord, we ask that your uh, grace would abound. God, that you would be merciful to us and Lord, especially for the three organizations and the many more that are in New York City, Lord, that you would continue to provide. Lord, that they would seek you for daily bread. You are the giver of life. You have provided us your own son when we were at war with you. You gave your one and only beloved so that we might have life and life abundant. And so, Lord, we know these things are not too much to ask for. And so, Lord, we ask and we a hope in great things. And we hope that this city, New York City in particular, and our world would come to know you, your love and your justice. We thank you, all the glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thanks everybody, thanks for joining. Um, thank you guests, thank you Tony, Hope for New York, thank you Mary Beth, have a great night. Hey guys. Thanks. Thank you so much.